We can be dream makers, nurturing, compassionate. Nosotros podemos ser más unidos. We can be anything. I'm Grant Oliphant. This is We Can Be. Today, our guest is Angela Blanchard. She has been a storm force gale of positivity for Houston, spending over two decades leading Baker Ripley as they provided $250 million annually toward services that make life better for all along the Texas Gulf Coast. She's been named one of Fast Company's 1,000 most creative people in business. And when relief efforts in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey seemed ready to fall apart, she was asked to step in and did so to universal acclaim. She is compassionate, smart, funny, and has one of the sharpest Twitter feeds around. And I am honored to share her story today. You have a deep, deep sense of social justice, but you also have a deep sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not accidental. If you'll forgive me reading one of your tweets, which, um, no, don't worry. This is, <laughs> this is a, but it's such a great story, and I... I think it speaks to gender issues in our culture and challenges that often confront nonprofit leaders. But you wrote, true story, I was at a White House meeting with President Obama. Man explains to me, if you want to succeed, you should learn about sports. I'm a grown-ass woman waiting to meet with POTUS because of my work, and this knucklehead has given me how to get ahead advice. How does humor help to break the ice on serious <laughs> subjects like that for you? Um, and God bless you for doing that. Well, that, God bless him, you know, because, I mean, that's what we say in Texas when, you know, we can't help you. Gosh, the whole thing happened because Magic Johnson was there, and there was talk of basketball going on, and I said, now, fellas, you know, when we get in there with the president, there was a tiny group of us he had invited to talk about community development. Are you guys going to keep on with the basketball thing? Or are we going to get to business? And so Mr. Johnson looks at me and he says, oh, it'll only last. It's just going to be over soon. It'll be okay. He's loads of fun, by the way. And uh, he said, so what's your team? And for a split second, I thought about naming a team, just any old team, but I thought, man, there's an equal chance it could just be a baseball team because I better not do that. And I said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I don't know anything about sports. I know you played basketball, but I don't even know which team. He found that hilarious. So we went on to flirt it up and have a wonderful time. And then Mr. Helpful taps me on my shoulder and says, you know, some women have taken the advice to learn about sports as a way to get ahead. And all I could think was, what does a head look like? Because this is the White House, and I'm about to meet with the president. I mean, that's a, that, isn't that kind of the definition of a head? But I was real nice to him because that's how my mother raised me. <laughs> but I think, I think we need humor. I'm Cajun, too, and honest to God, you know, there's nothing funnier to a Cajun than a, a person taking themselves real seriously. We're all just perfectly ridiculous thinking all of this should work. We're human and flawed, and this ain't heaven. It's earth. So we, we, we have plenty to laugh at. You know, there's a trick to the timing of being a speaker at one of these events. You want to arrive about when people are fully caffeinated, but hopefully just before they got to pee. Um, so I'm just hoping I've timed my appearance here correctly. And I want to talk about what makes a great city. And, and I believe that the greatest cities in the world are the most welcoming cities. It's not the infrastructure, it's not the building, it's not all the other fancy stuff we like to talk about. It's the successful cities are the cities that can turn the desperation that people feel into participation. So you have, through Baker Ripley and the work that the organization has done, you really spent decades trying to build Houston and, and make it a city for all. Can you just share with our listeners what it was about the work that was special? As we were doing it, uh, I don't think we were conscious of being special in any way. Uh, I actually imagined as I was working, there was someone like me in every city trying to make it work for everyone. Houston underwent this really phenomenally dramatic demographic change in becoming the most diverse city in the United States, which is pretty astonishing because it happened in such a short period of time. 
And not only did we need to be welcoming, we needed to create landing places for people as they arrived so they could earn, learn, and belong, and that we were fascinated with their strengths. We were obsessed with what was strong and competent and aspirational about them. So when we work from the aspirations of the people we are trying to help, we get into deep conversation with them about what is it that you're really trying to do, what matters most to you in the world. And you just tap into this uh, amazing sort of more generative conversation. And then when we invest in that which is most important to people, we're actually removing the rocks on the path that people want to be on. When you focus on that asset side of Mm -hmm. the equation instead of the deficit side, is it harder? How does that process happen? And do you get different solutions than you do if you're focusing on what the problem is? Well, you actually get real solutions. I mean, there have been times when I've seen people behave as if you, you just toss a little help over the fence and it ought to work. And really, there's a design that grows right out of how people learn and grow and what works for them. This is the premise of everything. I, all of my work has been premised upon this set of beliefs. One, I think there are three glorious universal aspirations. Earn, learn, and belong. Everyone wants to earn. There's not a soul I've ever met that in some way doesn't long to feel they have something to offer that the world wants. People want to learn. We all wish to be treated as though we're not a finished project, but a person with potential to to grow and develop. And we desperately want that for our children. Everyone wants that. So, and the third is belong. To be in a place and stand on ground that we feel in some way has welcomed us, where we have legitimacy. I'll give you one simple example from our recent work in a community in the in Harris County in Texas. A small community really struggling in every all the usual ways. So in our conversation with them, we said, well, of all the things that might go on here that could be useful to you, what would you want to see? And they said, well, we want help to grow our businesses. We got it out of the living room to the flea market to the small retail space. Now, how do we get it beyond the family business? So the program designed for that community is very much tailored to what help looks like to them so they can take the next right step in growing their business. We're really looking to invest in them so they can achieve what they set out to do in their lives. And I know this is a belief you share with me. We believe everyone should have an opportunity, and we believe all people are motivated to earn and learn and belong. So we invest that way. We design programs that way. It it creates a sort of generative change, not not a simple fix. I do share that belief with you, and and I... I absolutely love to sit and listen to you talk about it because you've got such a beautiful way of talking about it. So the elevator pitch on Baker Ripley would be... I've never actually been able to get it down to an elevator pitch. Okay. <laughs> Maybe a long subway ride. What would that look like? You know, in Houston, we just say in the time it takes you to get in a car from one end of the city to another, <laughs> which would be quite a while. I think it's really about investments in people and the belief that everyone in your city really matters and that no city can afford to try to move forward without every neighborhood and every community. There are so many headlines in this country and so many conversations that sound like, oh, we'd be a great city if only we had better people. If we, we'd we be a fabulous country if we could just find better people. And I honestly don't understand where that comes from. These are our people. There's no, there's no planet nearby with the Human Resources Department where we go get better people. So every city, every city, it's not, it's about investments in people. Those are permanent, they last, and if we treat the people as the first resource and make them the city, they will have success. We invest in their health, we invest in their education, we invest in their training, and then lo and behold, I mean, they do amazing things. And so believing in the people and trusting that the investments you make in people, not only do they pay off, they pay off forever. So I think we've lost that. There's a narrative in this country for every group about what's wrong with them. Mm. Uh, Every group, you know, and I'm not even going to repeat them because who needs to? That is a culture of blame and shame that seems to be particularly bad right now. And I'm curious how we combat that. I don't think we combat it. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's nothing more than a storm. 
And I've lived through plenty of those. And they're not pretty. And they're really tough. But while the storm is raging, it does no one any good to think about whose fault it is. It, this is our work. This is our time. And as city leaders, we hold ourselves accountable for making the city work for everybody, no matter what. Most of America's fourth largest city is now underwater. The National Weather Service has issued a flash flood emergency for catastrophic, life-threatening flooding. Thousands remain trapped. Local officials are very blunt about it. They do not have the resources to answer every call for help. The worst may be yet to come. I have to always break the news to people. This ain't heaven. It's earth. Shit goes wrong. And, you know, that's it. And, you know, it started raining in Houston uh, last year, and it just kept raining, and it rained, and it rained some more, because, you know, in Texas, we're going to do it. Even if we screw it up, we're going to do it real big. So we did Harvey real, real big, and we really, really needed each other. Hurricane Harvey is, along with Katrina, the most costly hurricane mm -hmm. in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. and, and that cost of $125 billion or so shouldn't just be measured in dollars because it's also the human toll, the third of the city being underwater. What happened for you when Harvey hit? First of all, it ain't our first rodeo, as we say in Texas, because we had Alice and Katrina, Rita, Ike, et cetera. So we had practiced before. We were preparing for what we usually do, which is the long-term recovery effort. Then I get this call. And it's someone saying, you need to call Judge Emmett, who's our county exec, the person who leads in disaster. I think he needs some help from you. So I called him and he said, we have buses coming and we don't have enough room for the people in them could you stand up a shelter at NRG, which is our big convention hall? And I said, yeah. And I had said to the judge, how long do I have one? And he said, how about today? And I said, all right. And I went to every team member that was already there. And I said, get three more people like you. Call everyone you know who will do whatever it takes to take care of their neighbors. And that's who we need. And so within just a few hours, we had 300 people and the buses began arriving. We were rolling and open at nine. And at that moment, everything we knew about community development, how to work in neighborhoods, how to do community events, my voice still shakes when I talk about it. We put it, we put it to work because these were our neighbors. And I insisted the one absolute rule I wouldn't tolerate any deviation from was every single person who arrived we referred to them either as guest or neighbor, nothing else, because that's in fact what they were. This is the NRG Center. It's a massive convention center and meeting hall in southwest Houston. It has a capacity for 10,000 people. Bus after bus dropping off more evacuees. Some arriving here without even shoes on their feet, long tables of volunteers handing out clothes. For those of you that are just arriving, welcome and please make your way inside. Uh, we were able to get two outfits each, and then from there we went from hygienal, um, soap, shampoo, toothpaste, everything. They had everything. We're not going to waste a thing. I, li I like these people. Like they're everybody here respectful. If you need help, if you look tired, whatever, you know, and you got kids, they'll help you watch your kids right there, you know, play with them and let you sleep. It's, a, it's just good to be grateful to have something, like, instead of nothing at all. Some three thousand Houstonians turned out to volunteer to pitch in some way. We try and volunteer, give away food whenever we can, help feed all these people inside. One of the things you did was mobilize interpreters in 16 different <laughs> yeah. languages. Well, not to brag, but of course I'm from Texas, so please expect that at least a little. But uh, we actually mobilized for 24 languages. And I think within a, the first couple of days, we checked in people in 16 languages, but we were prepared for checking them in in 24. Why, why did that matter? Oh, because Houston. It's who we are. Harris County. It's who we are. You know, when you say welcome, the person should be able to understand it. And we didn't want language to be in the way of helping people. So over the month the shelter was open, we served between 7,500 and 8,000 people from 111 cities on the Gulf Coast. It taught us all that when we have to, when it's really important and we really care, we can. And the other 
profoundly wonderful reminder in every storm is there really is enough to go around. And we see that each and every time we're faced with a challenge like that. It's good to remember it in between. Why are we so good at remembering that in crisis and so lousy at rem- mm. remembering it in policy? Actually, I, my belief, having now traveled the world uh, following every displacement disaster event, my belief is that's who we really are. It's in between that we forget it because the reflux, the generous reflux, you can count on it. The only unruly part of operating the shelter, the only part I couldn't quite get my arms around for several days was the volunteer entrance because so many people showed up to volunteer. We were completely overwhelmed by the people that wanted to help. So I think that's really fundamentally who we are. And then these stories that get told about our neighbors that we end up believing in some way interfere with the generous impulse. They get in the way of our natural belief in one another. Stories like that it's their fault and something they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Or stories like they didn't try hard enough or they just don't want to work. The great thing about a disaster is everybody's using their strength. You know, you get to see people not only at their best, but offering what they do best for their neighbor, and it's it's great. I'm really struck, though, by the way in which the country responded to that versus yeah. the way the country responded to Puerto Rico. And, yeah. I, and I just given your special perspective, what was different? Well, I, I don't really believe it's because it was an island, so as has been suggested. <laughs> I think, you know, it's a failure of empathy, but I think also we have an issue in this country with a failure of empathy for people who are brown. I mean, I I wanna speak frankly about that because it makes a very big difference to look into the TV screen, to see what's happening and think, that could be my mother, that could be my son. Something has to be done and we need to do it quickly. And I think the response wasn't what it should have been. I think the second part, Houston had learned so many hard lessons about you're on your own. We don't like to think of federal systems being broken, but I don't think there's any condemnation or even any secret about the fact that we know our emergency response system is just not geared up for the scale of what we're experiencing now. So we went into this thinking we're gonna be on our own for a while, and we didn't know how long. We had far more resources with our own city, with our own arena that we could call up. Our organization, for example, Puerto Rico is still struggling uh, because those resources weren't there. They didn't have them already in place. And what needed to be supported from the outside has been way too slow in coming. Mm. And it hurts to see it. It does. Texas is not known for being environmentally forward thinking, (laughs) but what happened in Houston is arguably symptomatic of the climate change yeah. we are experiencing yeah. and scientifically proven. Yeah. Has there been a an awakening since Harvey in the Houston community or in Texas more broadly about the perils of climate change for the state? Guys, you just really want to get me in trouble today, I, don't I you? I absolutely right. do. Okay, well, here goes. So I'm far from being uh, qualified to you know address oil companies in their agenda. I, I want to comment this way. It was very awkward. During the storm, people would would help, helpfully tweet things like, well, Houston's getting what it deserves because, of course, you're producing all the oil that's causing all the warming, That's, and now you're getting it back. And, you know, there was a part of me, you know, not the nice part of me, that wanted to say, well, we'll just stop and we'll see how you like it. But I, here's what's missing at the broad, in the broadest possible way. We have no coherent energy policy in this country. We have no coherent grasp of our dependency on oil. We think it's all about gasoline in the tank. And, you know, I had someone tweet at me, well, I ride my bike. And I said, well, honey, without oil, you'd be riding your bike naked without a seat. So, you know, we really have to come to grips with our dependency. And then we have to look at the alternatives. And that has to be at the national scale. And we've got oil companies, believe it or not, that do know that we need to look at different forms of energy And Houston aspires not only to be the oil and gas capital, but the energy capital. So a lot of those questions go on all the time in Houston. Now when you get to climate change, 
You know, I know I have friends that are willing to talk about climate change as long as you don't say it's our fault. <laughs> and, you know, being a pragmatist at heart, I really don't give a damn whose fault it is. The water is rising. And I want us to step up our awareness that we must, as cities and states, learn to live with water. This is not a one-off. The time when we could treat a Harvey as a one-off, my God, that was a big hurricane. That's ended. You know, I was interviewed a couple of weeks ago, and someone said, well, what happened in Houston? Is that our future? And I said, it's our now. Hmm. And I think my greatest fear is not of that the water's rising. My greatest fear is that we still talk about it like it's out there, and it's right here, and it's now. So, yes, we need a coherent energy policy. We need a new paradigm that doesn't require so much reliance on fossil fuel for everything. We need to understand the vulnerabilities, infrastructure vulnerabilities, and we need to start addressing those. And it's going to require some grown-ups at the federal level. And thank you for what I think is a wonderfully pragmatic perspective and yet still idealistic about what this challenge represents. I'm struck by the example you gave of the trolling that Houston was targeted with. And, you know, we sometimes forget the trolling comes from both the left and the right. And <laughs> yeah. and hating on victims is is a real problem in our culture, partly, by the way, as of maybe even a significant part as a result of social media. I got to watch you during this and following your Twitter feed, you were ferocious in how you fought for people, how you fought for resources, how you spoke about what was going on. You use social media platforms really well to talk about what's on your mind. How did you, you. ever make the decision to do that? Well, I worked with such a tribe at Baker Ripley that really a few of them, if they didn't see me on social media, they probably think it didn't exist. So there was that. What motivated me to start really being active on social media was I wanted to see what I wasn't going to get to see every day as CEO. So all these wonderful things occur in an organization of 1,500 plus staff and 71 locations. You know, we're still serving over half a million people every year. So the Imagine the incredible moments every day happening in all these centers with the children and the seniors and job training. And I didn't get to visit all that every time I wanted to. But on social media, I got to see the highlights that my team was posting, and it was wonderful. So that really motivated me. But I never really needed social media the way I did in the storm. We really ran NRG with social media. I had a, a team of people, and I said, I need you to be my amplifiers. Don't get ahead of me. Stay right with me. And when I say we need this, send it out. When I say we don't, send that out. And that kept us from being inundated with help that we couldn't use. And then it got us to things that we were desperate for right when we needed them. So it was extremely helpful. I think the ugly part of social media, for me, is uh, the loving detachment. You know, I pretty much feel this way. You can't just detach from the world because that's not responsible. So we have to be engaged. But the loving part is to stay present to people and connect with them on social media as if they were sitting next to you and share with them what you would if you were together. Because we really need to be together. You have spoken, I think, quite vigorously about the importance of being welcoming to immigrants and yeah. to refugees and victims of displacement. This is not a favorable political environment for that right now. <laughs> and so how do you articulate the case? Well, the same way I always have. I mean, it's our country. We're responsible for it. It's that promise and we need to keep it alive. And you have that obligation in good times and bad. You have it with storms, with no storms. You have it with a long, slow, unfolding political storm. It's still your job every day. We go and we do that. And whatever opportunities we had that made us who we are, we want to believe in the people around us that those opportunities uh, are worth something to them as well. Outrage never fed anyone. It never fulfilled anyone's dream. And outrage has no, it's not the fuel for change that we need. We don't get to choose the times we live in. Let's get after it.
Let's do the best we can. Do what we can with what we have, where we are right now. And I think we have to accept that we're not special in this country. Worldwide, cities and federal governments are at odds with one another, where people are having this ugly conversation about who should belong. In the meantime, cities like Pittsburgh and Houston and Portland and Austin and Tucson, are, people are figuring out how to make things work with their neighbors. Because it turns out we actually do need everyone. I love that phrase, we actually do need everyone. There is value in everyone, and Angela's tenacity in fighting for resources for the most vulnerable in her city in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey can be an inspiration for all of us. Our system is imperfect, and the political moment we live in seems determined to divide us. But if we can really view others through the lens of assets instead of deficits, we will be on the right road. If we approach our challenges by listening to those who are most affected and let their aspirations guide our work, we can find lasting solutions. And we will, as Angela so perfectly says, remove the rocks in our path.